Although Russ Lonzer asked me to be the honored guest for this year's meeting, the greatest honor that I will have this week is that of introducing him as the President of the Congress. As we go about our jobs, we rarely consider the many thankless hours of service that the major off officers in our organizations contribute to the benefit of us all. Russ has been a selfless contributor to our profession in many important roles. They, these include not only the many positions in which he has served the Congress over many years, including treasurer, uh, chair of the research committee, scientific program chair, and a long list of other important contributions. Since 2010, he has been the chair of the research subcommittee of the National Football League. He's also a member of the editorial boards of Neurosurgery and the Journal of Neurosurgery. He represents the third generation of physicians in his family. His father and grandfather were pathologists. He has now gone full circle. He was born in Ohio when his father was an intern. Soon afterward, his father took a residency in pathology at Loma Linda University and the family moved there. When his father completed his residency, they moved to Chicago where Russ grew up. He graduated with honors with a degree in economics from Andrews University, St. Andrews University, and then finished medical school at Loma Linda University School of Medicine where he also completed a surgical internship and began his residency in neurosurgery. In 1995, during his residency, he joined us at the NIH as a research fellow, and his capabilities became obvious immediately. During that interval, he began his long list of original contributions in biology and neurosurgery. After a couple of years of fellowship in neurosurgical research, he took a residency position at the University of Utah under the tutelage of uh, Ron Applebaum. When he finished his residency at the University of Utah, he returned to the NIH as a member of our faculty, where he demonstrated an exceptional capacity to, success, to select research projects that were important but also ones that, that would lead to success. He demonstrated an exceptional commitment to them and carried them through to completion. This was so for a long list of projects. He became chief of the surgical neurology branch at the NIH in 2005 and had a phenomenal interval of productivity as an investigator, demonstrated his skills as an exceptional surgeon in the complex surgery required for hemangioblastomas and endolymphatic sac tumors in patients with von hippel lindau disease, as well as pituitary surgery with a considerable experience and success in children with Cushing's disease. In 2012, he became professor and chairman of neurosurgery at Ohio State University, where he, ha where he heads a large, successful uh, neurosurgical department. Uh, for his work, he has received a considerable uh, list of awards. These include, for example, when he was uh, very early in his career, he received the Young Investigator Award from the American Brain Tumor Association by the Congress of Neurological Surgeons and the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. He received the Mahaley uh, Clinical Research Award also from the Congress and the American Association of Neurosurgeons. In 2013, he was the honored alumnus at his alma mater, uh, St. Andrews University. He has uh, authored a long list of original contributions, elucidating the biology, tumor behavior, and surgical management of hemangioblastomas. He's the world's expert in the uh, advancement of the understanding of the biology and endolymphatic sac tumors and their surgical treatment as well as understanding the mechanisms by which they produce hearing loss. He has been a substantial contributor uh, to the development and understanding of convection-enhanced drug delivery since its earliest days. 
I should emphasize that these contributions and many similar ones, uh, which are ongoing, uh, are going now on now over 17 years, longer than anybody else in the investigation of this concept as a drug delivery mechanism. He led a team of investigators that discovered the mutated, that the mutated allele of tumor suppressor genes, the protein product of the mutation that runs in the germline of affected families, retains function. But because of its abnormal shape, it's rapidly cleared uh, from the cytoplasm. He and his colleagues demonstrated that histone uh, deacetylase inhibitors can be used to, replace, to diminish the pace of this degradation and thus restore function of the protein and biological activity of the protein product. As you can appreciate, these discoveries have broad, very broad implications for potential tumor prevention and treatment for a broad range of uh, familial tumor suppressor gene syndromes, such as von hippel lindau disease, neurofibromatosis type 2, and many others. His accomplish accomplishments have clearly moved these fields forward. Many of these contributions are substantial advances in the knowledge of the biology of these various entities, indelible contributions, contributions that will be here long after all of us are gone. While he was the chief of uh, neurosurgery at the NIH, he, uh, working with Mark Shaffrey, our chair at the University of Virginia, uh, developed and gained approval of a new and a new type of neurosurgical residency, a, partner pro a partnership program between the NIH and the University of Virginia, which I hope will be another uh, one of his indelible uh, contributions. But Russ's lifetime uh, lottery winning event was, uh, came when, with uh, Carolyn when he married her. Uh, they were classmates in medical school, but uh, Carolyn's brother was also in the same class, and they often came to class together, and they had the same last name. And uh, so all their classmates uh, thought they were married. And that opened an opportunity for Russ, which he, having his uh, student intelligence, uh, took advantage of. They dated during medical school, and then when he uh, finished his, his fellowship at the NIH, and she had finished her residency in OBGYN at Loma Linda, uh, they were married. They are the parents of three beautiful children and talented daughters, uh, Hannah, now 15, Sarah, 12, and Alicia, a nine, who, I, who we're fortunate to have with us this morning. Russ has an openness about him that permits him to easily make friends. He's an excellent investigator, an exceptional surgeon and teacher, an effective leader of a large, complex department, and a loving husband and father and a loyal friend. These, of course, exemplify his character, which he got very much from his parents and from his family. As we all know, uh, character is the core measure of all of us. He shines very brightly in that category. For many years, I've been most fortunate to have him as a clear friend and colleague. It's a great honor and privilege to present him to you as our president for this year's Congress meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm honored and I'm humbled to have had the opportunity to serve as a president of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, or CNS, this past year. I wanted to start by acknowledging a number of individuals and groups that have tirelessly supported the CNS and our specialty these last 12 months. First, the CNS officers have devoted countless hours of their personal and professional lives to ensure the success of this organization and our specialty. The CNS Executive Committee has done a remarkable job in advancing worldwide education, patient care, and research. The 
2016 CNS Annual Meeting Committee, which was guided by Steve, uh, Jim, and Brian, have innovated this program in a number of ways. Over the next couple of days, and you already have, we'll enjoy their hard work and innovations. I'm exceptionally grateful for everything they have done. The CNS office, led by Regina Shupak, is our organizational face and implementation arm. Only because of them did we move forward in such an effective and in efficient way. As you all know, Nelson Ilyasiku is editor-in-chief of neurosurgery and the companion journals. These are foundational components of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons. Our journals have risen to historic heights and stature under his excellent stewardship. I've had the pri privilege to overlap my term as CNS president with Hunt Bajer and Rick Boop in their roles as NS president. Thank you for your excellent leadership and your collaboration. This year's CNS annual meeting international partner is the Continental Association of African Neurological Surgeons. Mike Dutravo and Graham Fegan, the leaders of this organization, are successfully bringing together a continent of neurologic surgeons to advance education and patient care across Africa. Our Washington office, led by Katie Rico, along with Shelley Timmons as Washington Committee Chair, have successfully championed our specialty's best interest, especially when it comes to government and regulatory agendas. These four exceptional individuals, Ron Affelbaum, Peter Heilbrunn, Ed Oldfield, and Jack Walker, have been my mentors. I'm truly indebted to them for their advice, motivation, and most of all, their friendship. I'm very grateful for the patience and support of my department and what they, that have, they have provided over the past year. These are some of the finest individuals in our field. I could not be prouder of all of them. I truly appreciate our resident support throughout this past year as well. These trainees and their fellow trainees around the globe are the reason our future of our, are the reason the future of our specialty is so bright. I'm deeply appreciative of all of you here today. You're the reason the CNS is, exists and is thriving. You represent all as great in neurosurgery. I want to thank you for taking your valuable time to come to this meeting. You being here is critical for the common good of our profession. Finally, I cannot thank my family enough. My parents, who have supported me my entire life, Carol, Hannah, Sarah, and Alicia, your steadfast support and love are gifts for which there are no words. None of this is possible without you. Advance, adapt, achieve. These three words exemplify and underscore the intrinsic qualities of each of you. These are the qualities that ensure the ongoing progress and success of our specialty. We all went into neurosurgery because of the rewarding challenges it presents and a better humankind. Throughout its history, neurosurgery has made critical advances and has successfully adapted to a continually changing environment of diversity and innovation. Because of these capabilities, we have achieved the loftiest of goals. As a specialty, we are leaders across all of medicine in innovative patient care, state-of-the-art education, government and regulatory impact, as well as world-class research. Our ability to advance, adapt, and achieve is impacted by innovative surgeons who can effectively respond to outside forces. These uh, forces, as shown on this timeline, include war, regulatory and social change, as well as scientific and technologic advances. Most recently, the technologic advances of the digital age, starting in the 1980s, have laid the groundwork for an unprecedented importance and prioritization of data. As a direct result of these changes, the most potent influence currently affecting medicine, specifically neurosurgery, is a rapidly expanding capability to acquire, store, process, and share data. These are at the core of our information age. I recently had the opportunity to, uh, to talk with Steve Wozniak, our 2016 Dandy Orator, who will be on next, and uh, his feelings about the impact of the information age changes on neurosurgery. Steve's conclusion is blunt. He said, we are at an intersection in time where technological advances are now driving critical advances in data analytics. These advances will inevitably shape patient care in important and beneficial ways. Data is now acquired from multiple ubiquitous sources. They are recording information across the spectrum of individual health, including research, social behavior, and physiology. IBM Healthcare Analytics estimate that because of all these sources of data acquisition, individuals born today will generate 100 gigabytes of medical data over their lifetime the equivalent of 300 million books. The University of Iowa study predicts that by 2020, the amount of medical data acquired in the United States alone will double every 73 days. 
Data is being acquired and data storage is being created at a rate of 6,000 meters squared per second. To put this into context, it's the same rate that a shockwave travels concentrically out from an atomic bomb explosion. That is occurring every second, though, with data acquisition and creation of data storage. Corresponding to the increases in data storage capacity, there's been a dramatic reduction in data storage costs. This permits the reduction of, the, permits the economical storage of data in perpetuity for patients around the world. That reality is essential for ensuring medical record keeping that can in turn foster more effective neurosurgical research. In parallel with the increases in data acquisition and storage, data processing and analytic speeds are increasing exponentially. In 2001, it took nearly a decade to sequence the human genome. Today, it takes only 26 hours. IBM's Watson can analyze 40 million medical documents in a mere 15 minutes. As data analytic speeds have increased, the corresponding cost of analysis have decreased. In 2001, it cost nearly $100 million to sequence the human genome. Today, it costs less than 1,000. Reduced processing costs provide significant opportunities to expand big data research into better personalized medicine for our patients, as you heard this morning. It's especially important when the complete genomic sequencing costs less than a single MRI. Neurosurgery is inevitably changing as a result of information sharing or connectivity. Data is now being shared globally in staggering amounts. In a minute alone in the United States, a mere minute, the following amount of data is shared. To put it into another context, by 2020, individuals around the world will each, on average, have 6.6 .6 connected devices. Our patients' data will be universally connected and shared. This will make patient care, medical education, and research accessible internationally to all. In the information age, unprecedented data acquisition, storage, analysis, and sharing will fundamentally change and improve neurosurgical clinical practice, education, and research. More than ever, to exploit these changes successfully, we need to do these things, advance, adapt, and achieve. In the data-driven information age, clinical practice will be impacted across preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative care. To best define how information ages changes will affect neurosurgical management may be useful to see its direct impact on a case example. This is a 50-year-old gentleman who presented with a seizure and intermittent speech hesitancy. His MR imaging shows a heterogeneously enhancing mass in the left frontal parietal region. He underwent gross total resection with mapping. Tumor histology was glioblastoma, and he underwent standard radiation and chemotherapy. He's now followed with serial MR imaging for recurrence. All of this is typical management for around the world. So what will be different for this patient moving forward in the information age? To start, preoperative care will be significantly augmented by imaging data processing not possible just a few years ago. Imaging repositories coupled with powerful analytic algorithms can determine genomic profiles using standard MR sequences before the surgical treatment of the tumor even occurs. This emerging field of radiogenomics will guide surgical treatment and improve prognostication and inform research. The accessibility and low cost of complete tumor genome sequencing and detailed molecular analyses will dramatically increase their use and application. Eric Holland at the University of Washington and other groups have turned to big data analyses to define glioma clusters with distinct sequence, expression, and methylation profiles. These are not only prognostic indicators. They are enriching for tumor-specific drug targets for individual, uh, individualized treatment similar to what you heard Mitch Berger talk about in the Agile trial last night. The treatment potency of such a molecular-based approach is underscored by the success of treating colon cancer based on individual tumor genomics and molecular signature. Colon cancer with wild type, KRAS gene, and EGFR expression can be treated with agents that specifically target intact KRAS EGFR pathways. This resulted in a near doubling in survival in this patient group. Genomics and computer analytics are now also beginning uh, to be used to diagnose and treat patients. 20 months after falling ill, a woman in her 60s at the University of Tokyo remained diagnosed and dying, despite state-of-the-art evaluation and care. For the first time just seven weeks ago, IBM's Watson was used to review this patient's uh, tumor genomic data in medical records. Watson correctly diagnosed a rare leukemia and recommended a successful treatment plan after analyzing the case for 10 minutes. Unique tumor markers identified by genomic sequencing can also provide for more precise diagnosis 
as well as track tumor progression using peripheral blood samples or liquid biopsies that carry the unique DNA signature of the tumor. To assess for infection and other post-operative complications, wearable technology and smartphones are being evaluated as tools to monitor and transmit data. Data collected and monitored includes temperature, EKG, blood sugar, and electrolytes and sweat. This permits the early treatment of complications in post-operative patients before they become serious and require hospitalization. Essentia Health recently used a similar type of home monitoring paradigm via smartphone data collection and sharing combined with computer analytics to identify vital signs predictive of clinical problems associated with heart disease that could be effectively managed at home. This paradigm reduced heart disease reemission rates to 2%. Compare that to the national average of 25%. Big data analytics from non-traditional source, sources, which you'll hear more about tomorrow in detail from Victor Mayer, are also being used to predict and identify complications and adverse drug reactions. Just this year, by simply reviewing internet search terms used by patients taking multiple medications, computer analytics more accurately predicted and better identified adverse drug reactions, 19% better, in fact, than physician reporting to the FDA. Just last month, it was reported that an individual's internet search analyses related to signs and symptoms found with various types of cancer could provide earlier detection of various types of cancer. For example, 15% of pancreatic adenocarcinoma patients could be diagnosed months before they came to the attention of medical care by simply evaluating their internet search term history. In the years ahead, education and residency and lifelong learning will be profoundly changed by the information age. As with prior educational advances, neurosurgery will be a leader across medicine. Similar to the concept of 3D anatomic teaching that Al Roten pioneered 20 years ago, merging technologic and data advances now permit for virtual 3D case review for education and preoperative planning. The fusion of a variety of imaging modalities, MRs, CTs, and angiograms into a virtual reality paradigm just became feasible within the last few years and is now being used at a handful but growing number of centers in the United States for preoperative planning and resident education. Just a few years ago, patient-specific 3D printed surgical simulation models were only an idea. Today they are a reality and can be feasibly made from patient images. These individualized 3D simulated models that include the ability to vary blood flow, blood pressure and temperature can be used to evaluate various approaches on a variety of neurosurgical pathologies. Here, an aneurysm of a six-year-old female is simulated for teaching and preoperative endovascular approach assessment. This simulation technology will be demonstrated later in the operative neurosurgery session for the first time. This year, at several medical schools, including Case in Ohio, 3D holographic imaging for the first time will be used to teach medical school students normal and patient-specific pathologic anatomy. Based on the potential of this type of anatomic teaching, the number of medical schools using this technology will, ensure, will assuredly grow rapidly. These technological tools will help overcome limitations imposed by duty hours restrictions, which have negatively impacted resident hands-on experience and training. These tools will also enhance preoperative planning and approach assessment for neurosurgeons in practice. Research will be radically different in the information age. Research will move in significant ways from hypothesis-driven research to correlative science derived from large data analytics. An illustrative case of correlative research involves the discovery of hand washing to prevent infection by Ignaz Simmelweis in the mid-1800s. Some of you may already be familiar with his story. He associated hand washing with a dramatic reduction in postpartum purple fever. The reduction of infection resulted in a tenfold decrease in mortality at his institution. At the time, other physicians and institutions did not accept hand washing because there was no biologic explanation for why it reduced infection. It was not until two decades later that hand washing was accepted, only after the germ theory was established as the biologic cause for infection. Unfortunately, countless numbers of mothers died unnecessarily in the interim. Similarly, in the information age, critical associations will be derived frequently from big data analytics before biologic mechanisms are understood. Traditionally, physicians are resistant to correlation-based research, as you saw from that example. But in the information age, we will need to become comfortable with them for optimal patient management. 
An emerging example of a research paradigm in the information age is Orion, stands for the Oncology Research Information Exchange Network. This program links 13 academic centers and private practice groups in tumor treatment and research. Patients are enrolled in this study, their tumor undergoes genomic sequencing, and they are followed for life. The data, imaging, genomic, clinical, and survival, is stored, shared, and analyzed. So far, 134 patients and growing have been enrolled. The collective data is analyzed for prognostic, predictive, and optimal treatment correlations. Another example of big data research made possible in the information age and includes the human brain connectome, which is providing unprecedented fiber track detail. These data were derived from more, nearly 1,000 normal patient MRIs. These findings have set the stage for studies of normal and abnormal brain circuits. Connectome data is also being coupled with complex physiologic data sets at the single patient and multi-patient levels to determine how information flows in the brain by guys like Kareem Zagul and others. As a result of processing analytic speeds possible today, what would take months to analyze only a few years ago can now be done in less than a day. Combining connectome and physiologic data is rapidly providing biologic insights that were not previously possible or imaginable. We've examined a number and by no means complete list of emerging technologies and data streaming that can impact neurosurgical patient care, education and research in the information age. But there remains a threshold question. What is the likelihood in the near future or at all that these changes will be adopted? To answer that question, it's probably most important to understand the rate of technology adoption across society in the last century and a half, as adoption of medical changes parallel these societal adoption times. Adoption is defined as a time of when a technology is available to when 25% of households, or in this case neurosurgeons, use the technology. Since 1870, adoption times of new technologies has shortened dramatically. For example, adoption of electricity was 46 years or two generations. TV was 26 years or one generation. The web took seven years. Most recently, social media took only 18 months to adopt. It's quite reasonable to think that many or all the changes I've described will be adopted during our careers, in a very short period of time, in fact. With the imminent adoption of information change advance, information age advances, how do we maximize the transformational opportunities they present? For example, in the patient I showed earlier, Clinically, we need to continue to be leaders in the transformation of health care, commit to innovation, build data-driven capabilities, and accelerate better outcomes through patient data and analytics. The information age will uncover new unimaginable learning opportunities and research opportunities that we can exploit for innovative purposes to further improve patient care and our practices. Educationally, we need to continue to lead in the development of technologies that expand individualized patient simulation and preoperative technique assessment. This will obviously enhance resident education and patient safety. Clinical scientific investigation by surgeons across all practice types, academic, hospital-based, and private, is now possible and, in fact, necessary. Embrace big data, derive correlative science, but validate those results and exploit the findings to drive further hypothesis-driven research. This is a critically important time in neurosurgery. It is an inflection point for our specialty. We are now most impacted by information age changes in which the data is prioritized. The, ad the adoption of these changes is, is advancing at a pace never seen before. As we have done throughout history, we are adapting to these changes in fundamental and positive ways. This is leading us to achieve accelerated improvements in neurosurgical care, education, and research that were not imaginable just a short time ago. Advance, adapt, achieve. That's really our mission. That's the basis upon which we improve the lives of our patients. We must not and we will not fall short. We will advance, we will adapt, and we will achieve. That is who we are. Thank you.